Welcome to the Success Series Podcast. This is Jay Preston. This podcast is created by the Presto Post, an online magazine dedicated to producing articles that add value to your life, that inspire you, that teach you, that encourage deeper thinking, that stop you right in your tracks, that mean something, that are evergreen. This podcast is all about that. This show is also brought to you by SiteGround. SiteGround are perhaps the number one company when it comes to developing your own website. Now a lot of companies claim to be the number one, but seriously, SiteGround are. They have 24-7 and instant customer service, which is outstanding. They have super fast web hosting, and both user-friendly and non-user-friendly, or in other words, developer interfaces which make building, editing, and maintaining your website an absolute breeze. This advertisement is as personal as you can get. SiteGround are the folks behind our own website, the Presto Post, and having been through several web hosts prior to trying them, I don't say this lightly. They are the best, and I highly recommend them if you have a website and are looking for a more reliable and faster host, or have no website but really, really want one. To get a nice introductory offer and to help support this show and our website, go to prestopost.org forward slash ads and click the link, which will take you straight to their site. The Success Series podcast is all about the secrets, recipes and philosophies of some of the world's most famous and successful people, be them composers, actors, actresses, entrepreneurs, painters, investors, authors, journalists, philosophers, scientists, you name it. Each episode features one person and typically seven to ten separate pieces of advice. However, these podcasts are not interviews done by us. What we do instead is comb the internet platforms for any recordings and audio clips that already exist, study them and then separate the wheat from the chaff. These podcasts are the wheat, or better put, the audio equivalent of your favourite superfood. Not a fan of superfoods? Well, consider them the audio equivalent of the food item that you just can't live without. Anyway, enough about food, which is making me hungry. On to the show. This is our second podcast featuring Charlie Munger. If you listened to the first, you'll remember me saying there was simply too much Munger wisdom to fit into one podcast. Well, this is that too much. If you haven't listened to that podcast, however, fear not. The two are equally as valuable independent of each other. This isn't the Hunger Games. Plus, for the sake of simplicity, we are using the same intro, which will tell you just enough about the man to make sense of the lessons that he shares. Here then, is that very intro. Followed by seven, nope, we've gone over followed by eight pieces of counsel from the king of all Mungerism kings, Charlie Munger himself. Today's guest should need very little introduction. Should, but in fact does. Charlie Munger is a man who vehemently dislikes the spotlight, and so has spent his life trying to avoid it. The reason he should need very little introduction is, ironically, also the reason he does need introduction. Charlie Munger is known as Warren Buffett's right-hand man, and is the man to whom Buffett credits most of his success. This is not a trivial claim, and it highlights one of the many reasons more people ought to know about Charlie, if only for the fact that Buffett has a net worth of about $84 billion. Because Warren loves the spotlight, in contrast to his friend, Charlie has naturally let him take it during the several decades that they've been in the public eye. Whilst this has served Charlie well, however, it also means less people know about him, Why this is unfortunate is not just because he made Warren magnificently rich and successful. He is also a profound intellect and treasure trove of worldly wisdom, which he shares in the form of stories, blunt axioms and esoteric jokes. Charlie's Wikipedia page has him as an American investor, businessman, author, philanthropist and as vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. This says very little though about the extremely eventful and productive life he has lived, which includes a career in law been the top man in several different corporations, including a hospital, and lots and lots of philanthropy work. Charlie and Warren host the wildly popular Berkshire Hathaway annual conference. This is where the company shareholders and a selected number of journalists get together to listen to the two of them, usually for several hours, 
give updates and their thoughts on the past year and answer questions about business, life and sometimes about Warren's Coca-Cola and peanut brittle diet. The fact that many people attend this event for nothing else but to listen to the wise words of Charlie Munger says an awful lot. For a deeper insight into Charlie's life, I recommend two fantastic books. First is Getting Behind the Scenes with Charlie Munger by Janet Lowe. Second is Poor Charlie's Almanac. The first book digs deep into his personal life, whilst the latter is almost exclusively about his work, teachings and advice. And now for the man himself. Here is Charlie Munger. 1. The last thing you want at your funeral is one attendee. In other words, you want to kick the bucket having first left a good impression on the people you came into contact with before you kick it. Of course, being a good person is not the easiest thing in the world. Life gives us many a reason to fall into bouts of frustration, sadness, self-pity, misery, you name the emotion. But almost all of these reasons are inadequate. Our poor attempts to make lack of effort, kindness and goodness okay. It is almost never okay. Trust makes the world go around. Hence, the principal question one should use to guide their actions in life is the following. How can I earn, not buy, fiddle, force or beg, but earn? How can I earn the respect and trust of others? What are the core ideas that have helped me? Well, luckily I got at a very early age the idea that the safest way to try and get what you want is to try and deserve what you want. It's such a simple idea. It's the golden rule, so to speak. You, you want to deliver to the world what you would buy if you were on the other end. There is no ethos, in my opinion, that is better for any lawyer or any other person to have. By and large, the people who've had this ethos uh, win in life, and they don't win just money, just honors and emoluments. They win the respect, the deserved trust of the people they deal with. And there is huge pleasure in life to be obtained from getting deserved trust. And so, and the way to get it is to deliver what you'd want to buy if the circumstances were reversed. Now, occasionally you find a perfect rogue of a person who dies rich and with uh, and widely known. But mostly these people are fully understood by the surrounding civilization. And when the cathedral is full of people at the funeral ceremony, most of them are, are there to celebrate the fact that the person is dead. And uh, that reminds me of the story of the time when one of these people died and the minister said, it's now time for someone to say something nice about the deceased. And nobody came forward. And nobody came forward. And nobody came forward. And finally one man came up and he said, well, his brother was worse. That is not where you want to go. That's not the kind of funeral you want to have. You'll leave entirely the wrong example. 2. Optimism is as good as long as it doesn't blind. Once it starts to distort your already distorted view of reality, no longer is it optimism. It is foolish ignorance. This can happen both intentionally and not. For example, one can be by nature an overly optimistic person, which, whilst it may keep them happier than Larry when everything is going right, does very little to prepare them for when nothing is going right. On the other hand, an individual can consciously adopt an optimistic mindset as a way of distracting themselves from potholes, quicksand and the odd grim reaper, which obviously is a terrible idea. There is one fact about life for which you can be certain. Over the course of your existence, you will be presented with many challenges, problems, idiots, con artists, traumas, and the occasional catastrophe. How you respond to these events is important, but how you prepare is far, far more important. Lardy philosophies are good only until shit hits a fan. 
and you bet shit will hit the fan many times. They don't prepare you for trouble, so when it does come along, you're like the frozen deer in headlights. The alternative philosophy is to go through life anticipating trouble. Of course, you can never be fully prepared for anything in life, but by expecting trouble as you walk along the path, you're far more equipped to respond. My grandfather was the only federal judge in his city for nearly 40 years, and I really admired him. I'm his namesake. And I'm Confucian enough that even now, I sit here and I'm saying, well, uh, Judge Munger would be pleased to see me here. So I'm Confucian enough all these years after my grandfather is dead to carry the torch for my grandfather's values. And Grandfather Munger was a federal judge at a time and there were no pensions for, for widows of federal judges. So if he didn't save from his income, why my grandmother would have been in penury. And being the kind of man he was, he underspent his income all his life and left her in comfortable circumstances. Along the way, in the 30s, my uncle's bank failed and couldn't reopen. And my grandfather saved the bank by taking over a third of his assets, good assets, and putting them into the bank and taking the horrible assets in exchange. And of course, it did save the bank. And and while my grandfather took a loss, he got most of his money back eventually. Uh, but I've always remembered the example. And so when I got to college and I came across Hausman, I remembered a little poem from Hausman, and it went something like this. The thoughts of others were light and fleeting, of lovers meeting, luck or fame. Mine were of trouble and mine were steady, and I was ready when trouble came. You can say, who wants to go through life anticipating trouble? Well, I did. All my life I've gone through life anticipating trouble. Here I am well along in my 84th year, and like Epictetus, I've had a favored life. It didn't make me unhappy to anticipate trouble all the time and be ready to perform adequately if trouble came. It didn't hurt me at all. In fact, it helped me. So I quit claim to you Houseman and Judge Munger. Number three. If you want to get ahead in life, learn. Marcus Cicero once said, he who does not learn anything about history goes through his whole life living like a child. Charlie uses this quote in the following clip, in which he is explaining the importance of knowing how and why things work, today and have done in the past. But knowing, in this sense, doesn't mean just not being ignorant of, say, history, or how the economy works, or any other crooks of culture, or science, or politics. It means confident, deep, and true understanding of these, what Charlie calls, big ideas. Being not only broad, but diligent and far-reaching in your learning will give you real-life superpowers. On the other hand, be ignorant, shallow, and superficial in your approach, and you're like the incredible Hulk trying to save the world after someone secretly slipped an e-tablet in your glass of orange juice. Everything is going wrong, but you don't know why. I'm really following a very key idea of the greatest lawyer of antiquity, Marcus Tullus Cicero. And Cicero is famous for saying, a man who doesn't know what happened before he's born goes through life like a child. Now that is a very correct idea of Cicero's, and he's right to ridicule somebody so foolish as not to know what happened before he was born. But if you generalize Cicero, as I think one should, there are all these other things that you should know in addition to history. And those other things are the big ideas in all the other disciplines. And it doesn't help you just to know them enough so you can prattle them back on an exam and get an A. You have to learn these things in such a way that they're in a mental lattice work in your head and you automatically use them for the rest of your life. If you do that, I solemnly promise you that one day you'll be walking down the street and you'll look to your right and left and you'll think, my heavenly days, I'm now one of the few most competent people of my whole age cohort. If you don't do it, many of the brightest of you will live in the middle ranks or in the shallows. 
Carrying on from the last, lesson number four is about intellectual honesty. Being merely aware of something does not qualify as understanding. And understanding is not by definition deep understanding. To use an analogy, if you're going to play ball in a field for the first time with other more experienced ball players, then you want to know the rules of the game before the whistle blows. Unless, of course, you're interested in getting seriously hurt, in which case it's a great idea. Essentially, you want to avoid shallow understanding of the key aspects of your life. If you're in the market game, for example, then you ought to know everything there is to know about it. Likewise, if you're going for a full-time professor in quantum theory at Stanford, you better know quantum theory inside out and better than anyone else you know. You can fake it for a while, of course. You may even get very lucky and experience some notable success. But sooner or later, you will be exposed. This is intellectual dishonesty. Both of the examples given are not only dangerous on the personal level, neither. The fake trader could take down the business he works for, and therefore all the employees and their families with it. The fake professor, once exposed, could tarnish the university's and his own colleagues' reputation, whilst also forcing his students to rethink everything he had taught them. The upshot is, avoid surface knowledge. Doing this with all of your interests is impossible, but in the most important ones, deep knowledge is crucial. I frequently tell the story of, of Max Planck when he won the Nobel Prize and went around Germany giving lectures on quantum mechanics. And the chauffeur gradually mem memorized the lecture and he said, would you mind, Professor Planck, just because it's so boring to stay in our routines, would you mind if I gave the lecture this time and you just sat in front of my chauffeur's hat? And Planck said, sure. And the chauffeur got up and he gave this long lecture on quantum mechanics, and after which a physics professor stood up in the rear and asked a perfectly ghastly question. And the chauffeur said, well, he says, I'm surprised that in an advanced city like Munich, I get such an elementary question. I'm going to ask my chauffeur to reply. <laughs> well, the reason I tell that story is not entirely to celebrate the quick-wittedness quick of the protagonist. In this world, we have two kinds of knowledge. One is plank knowledge, the people who really know. They've paid the dues, they have the aptitude. And then we got chauffeur knowledge. They have learned to prattle the talk. And they have a big head of hair, they may have fine timber in the voice, they really make a hell of an impression. But in the end, they've got chauffeur knowledge. I think I've just described practically every politician in the United States. And this, And you're going to have the problem in your life of getting the responsibility into the people with the plank knowledge and away from the people who have the chauffeur knowledge. And there are huge forces working against you. My generation has failed you to some extent. We are delivering to you in California a legislature where only the certified nuts from the left and the certified nuts from the right are allowed to serve, and none of them are removable. That's what my generation has done for you. But you wouldn't like it to be too easy, would you? Number five, quite simply, is avoid perverse incentives. Incentives are quite important. They are why we work. They influence our tastes, our goals, the way we dress. They control our thoughts, habits, behaviors. They are sources of motivation, of fear. They control criminals. They make governments possible. They are important and they are powerful. But what if this power was to be misused, corrupted, manipulated? Alas, like everything good, incentives can also be used perversely and for evil. There are many subconscious incentives that influence how we live. But the conscious ones, and the most relevant here, are money, power and authority, and fear. For example, most people go to work not because they enjoy it, but because they get paid. This is the money incentive. A handyman might work his way up the ladder because the concept of power excites him. The power incentive. A driver will drive more carefully when there is a police car behind him. The authority incentive. And a potential evildoer may not carry out his plans through fear of jail time. 
That's the fear incentive. These, you could say, are good uses of incentives. An example of perverse use would be a manipulated boss who keeps you quiet by either threatening you or giving you a raise. Another example would be marriage in the name of finance only. The thing about perverse incentives is that they play on multiple different systems. In other words, perverse incentivization is typically a series of singular perverse incentives which each play off each other. You mingle with them at your peril. Another thing, perverse incentives. You don't want to be in a perverse incentive system that's causing you to behave more and more foolishly or worse and worse. Incentives are too powerful a controller of human cognition and human behavior. And one of the things you're going to find in some modern law firms is billable hour quotas. And I could not have lived under a billable hour quota of 2,400 hours a year. Uh, that would have caused huge problems for me. I wouldn't have done it. And uh, I don't have a solution for that for you. You'll have to figure it out for yourself. But it's a significant problem. Perverse associations also to be avoided. And you particularly want to avoid working directly under somebody you really don't admire and don't want to be like. Uh, it's very dangerous. We're all subject to control to some extent by authority figures, particularly authority figures that are rewarding us. And that requires some talent. The way I solved that is I figured out the people I did admire and I maneuvered cleverly without criticizing anybody. So I was working entirely under people I admired. And a lot of law firms will permit that if you're shrewd enough to, to uh, work it out. And your outcome in life will be more, way more satisfactory and way better if you work under people you really admire. The alternative is not a good idea. Six, save your money. Yes, it's a cliche, but cliches are often true. And no, it may not be easy to save your money, but excuse making does nothing, which is another cliche, of course. If your struggle to save money is harming you, or will harm you or your close ones in the future, then you and only you can do something about it, right now. If you have a tendency to spend, which, because today's culture constantly forces it upon us, includes literally everyone but the odd recluse, then you have to take responsibility. How? First, contract yourself into paying into a monthly no transaction, no withdrawal savings account. Once you accept this, then you work on your spending. Reverse engineering this method is futile. If you're trying to reduce your spending without immediate punishment, which you get in the form of a penalty with such a savings account, or some other powerful incentive, then you're walking along a very slippery slope, and will most likely fall over so many times that you give up. It's much easier to carry on spending, of course. Setting up a savings account that you can't withdraw from forces you to save because if you try to withdraw you lose money. The fundamental lesson here is of course not just about saving money. There is an underlying principle that pertains to most of what is important in life, namely that incentives are everywhere and in no place are they more prevalent than in ourselves. Hence we must work not only to identify them in the world in others and in ourselves, but also against them and use them to our advantage. Arguing against your own opinions is an example of working against them. Contracting yourself to a savings account is using them to your advantage. Perhaps the fundamental lesson is even simpler. Just don't be a donkey. Another thing, of course, that does one in is the self-serving bias to which we're all subject. You think the true little me is entitled to do what it wants to do. And for instance, why shouldn't the true little me overspend my income? Well, there once was a man who became the most famous composer in the world, but he was utterly miserable most of the time. And one of the reasons was he always overspent his income. 
that was Mozart. If Mozart can't get by with this kind of asinine conduct, I don't think you should try it. 7. Strong opinions and beliefs are the ultimate influencers of behaviour. They are the puppeteers to the puppets. And we are the puppets. Take belief in God, for example. The idea that there is a superior, all-knowing and all-powerful and sacred being watching over humanity has served in large part as tamer of the lion side of human nature, or rather, as an invisible syringe drawing out whatever good that exists in the human soul. Likewise with religion, which has transformed criminals, built civilizations, and has been the foundation of morality for thousands and thousands of years. But remember, everything good has the potential to create just as much bad. Beliefs in God and religious fundamentalism have been the foundations of such disgusting things as homophobia, female oppression, terrorism and slavery. But let's not get caught up in theological discussions. The point is, the highest and or strongest ideas you hold are what control and drive you the most. You could say, I suppose, they are your own version of God. It goes, therefore, that being extremely careful of what you believe, period, not just what you strongly believe, for all beliefs are influential to some degree or another, can serve you very well in life. In fact, it is hard to argue, I would say, that there is anything more important than knowing what your beliefs are. Seeing as we act out most of our beliefs unconsciously, identifying them, and if necessary, tearing them apart, isn't as simple or easy as it sounds. But the importance becomes obvious when you realise that it is they that control you, how you act, think, live, exist, and not you, that is, not the conscious you. When you consider the fact that it is your very life that you are talking about, no, there is nothing more important. Another thing I think should be avoided is extremely intense ideology because it cabbages up one's mind. You've seen that. And you see a lot of it, you know, in TV preachers, for instance. You know, they've all got different ideas about theology, and, and, uh, and a lot of them have minds that are made of cabbage. And, and, but that can happen with political ideology. And if you're young, it's easy to drift into loyalties. And when you announce that you're a loyal member, and you start shouting the orthodox ideology out, what you're doing is pounding it in, pounding it in. And you're gradually ruining your mind. So you want to be very, very careful with this ideology. I if you, it, it's a big danger. In my mind, I've got a little example I use whenever I think about ideology, and that's the Scandinavian canoeists who succeeded in taming all the rapids of Scandinavia, and they thought they would tackle the whirlpools of the Aran Rapids here in the United States. The death rate was 100%. A big whirlpool is not something you want to go into. And I think the same is true about a really deep ideology. I have what I call an iron prescription that helps me keep sane when I naturally drift toward preferring one ideology over another. And that is, I say, I'm not entitled to have an opinion on this subject unless I can state the arguments against my position better than the people do who are supporting it. I think only when I've reached that state am I qualified to speak. Now, you can say that's a, too much of an iron discipline. It's not too much of an iron discipline. It isn't even that hard to do. It sounds a lot like the iron prescription of Ferdinand the Great. It's not necessary to hope in order to persevere. That probably is too tough for most people. I don't think it's too tough for me, but it's too tough for most people. But this business of not drifting into the extreme ideology is a very, very important thing in life. If you want to have more correct knowledge and be wiser than other people, the heavy ideology is very likely to do you in. And finally, number eight, it is easy and in fact normal to think otherwise, but we are not 
living in the highest state a civilization can reach. No, we are in a unique age, but we have by no means created the best possible world. The word possible here is everything, as opposed to a world built on trust, love, ethics and rationale. A utopian or completely balanced world is not possible, not to mention both implausible and dull. I call this the golden age fallacy. This is our tendency to think we are living in a or the golden age, which may indeed be true in a specific sense with such things as Wi-Fi, universal connection, AI and space travel. But in the broader sense, it's most likely delusional. Even if we are in the golden age, there can be no denying that we still have much room for improvement, that society can function better, that life today can be more meaningful and rich, that we can take civilization even higher. Charlie calls such a world, a world built upon a seamless web of deserved trust. What this means is rather simple. Each person rightfully earns the trust and respect that they need, want and will be able to thrive upon. It is a world heightened by the fruits of hard work, care, diligence, love, by moral values, by trust. The last idea that I want to give to you as you go out into a profession that is frequently puts a lot of procedure and a lot of precautions and a lot of mumbo jumbo into what it does. This is not the highest form which civilization can reach. The highest form that civilization can reach is a seamless web of deserved trust. Not much procedure, just totally reliable people correctly trusting one another. That's the way an operating room works at the Mayo Clinic. If a bunch of lawyers were to introduce a lot of process, the patients would all die. So never forget when you're a lawyer that you may be sold for selling this stuff, but you don't have to buy it. You, you may be rewarded for selling it, but you don't have to buy it. In your own life, what you want is a seamless web of deserved trust. And if your proposed marriage contract has 47 pages, my suggestion is you not enter. Well, that's enough for one graduation. I hope these ruminations of an old man are useful to you. In the end, I'm like the uh, old valiant for truth in Pilgrim's Progress. My sword I leave to him who can wear it. If you like the Success Series podcast, there are many ways you can support it. You can leave a review on iTunes, on our website, or any place else the podcast appears. You can share it with friends, on social media, or on your own blog or podcast. You can purchase any books we recommend in various articles on our website, the Presto Post, using the hyperlinks, which will take you straight to Amazon. You can hijack the microphone the next time you find yourself in a karaoke night and yell out the URL to our podcast feed. Or you can support us directly with a donation by going to prestopost.org forward slash support, where you'll find all the necessary links. As always, thank you for listening.